Hey, everybody. New lecture. This is the one that you guys have been waiting for. Nursing care plans. Ah, oh, everybody hates nursing care plans. I never understood why, because care plans are so easy. They're as easy as medical math. Because it's, it's just all you're doing is you're looking at your patient, assessing your patient, saying to yourself, what's wrong with them? What could go wrong with them? And what can I do about it independently, right? So I've got a PowerPoint to go along with this one too that you're going to love. Let me share my screen and let me clear my throat. Just kidding. All right, here we go. So care plans are easy. Everything you wanted to know about care plans, we're afraid to ask. All right, I'm going to put this in slideshow mode. So this way you can see absolutely perfectly. And I'm going to make this available to you on my website today. And I'll give you all that information on Facebook, on my Facebook page, and also on my YouTube channel. So get ready and let's rock and roll. All right, so care plans are easy. So the care plan is about the patient, right? So you're saying to yourself, like I said earlier, what is the patient at risk for? Or what do they actually have going on that I can do something about independently, right? So not medical diagnosis. We're talking about nursing diagnoses. And there's only a limited number of nursing diagnoses. So you can't just make them up. You have to pull one from the NANDA list. And I included the entire list here in this PowerPoint. You're welcome. I dropped the mic. Boom. Okay, so the patient assessment is what drives what you do, okay? You don't like come up with a diagnosis and go, well, I know risk for falls and let me see, is this patient at risk for fall? It's the other way around, right? So what's your assessment of your patient? What's their medical diagnosis? How are their vital signs? How's their oxygen? Is there pain? How are they with ADLs? Do they need teaching? What, what do they need? Are they at risk for a potential problem? or do they currently have a problem that you can independently resolve, okay? So you wanna focus on the nursing process. And I say this over and over again, right? The nursing process basically runs everything that we do in nursing. And the nursing process is ADPOT, assessment, diagnosis, planning, intervention or implementation, and then evaluation. So in other words, you're doing an assessment. You're doing a full head to toe assessment and figuring out what's going on with this patient. And then you're determining what the diagnosis is for this patient, right? So you wanna make a list of whatever's out of whack, the abnormal data, and then look at the NANDA list and say, well, what fits this, okay? Then you're gonna plan, you're gonna write measurable goals. And just to be clear, the word goals and the word outcomes, they mean the same thing. All right. So basically, what is it you're trying to achieve? And, you know, your nursing interventions have to match what you want to happen. And also, they remember, your goals and outcomes must always be measurable. OK, if it's somebody in a hospital, it's going to be more short term. The next shift, you know, patient will remain free from infection for the next 24 hours, or 48 hours. Long term care can be lengthier than that. So, and then you're going to implement or, you know, intervene. So you're going to initiate whatever your interventions are. You're going to do them and then evaluate. Did it work? Right. So, you know, the foundation of all care plans is what's going on with your patient. And also, I think that sometimes we're not clear about helping you understand. We don't expect student nurses to just whoop, out of thin air, come up with the nursing diagnosis and the interventions and the rationales for the interventions. Everything is out there. Every textbook that you have, every nursing textbook for adult med surge, for maternal newborn and for peds, when you look in each chapter, there's going to be a part of the chapter called the nursing process, or it will say care plans. And it's right there for you, okay? So you, you don't need to rack your brain for hours. A care plan, after you've done a good assessment on a patient, shouldn't take you more than a half an hour. And if it does, you're doing something wrong, okay? So remember, and you, know, you have to be good at assessing the patient. And that takes time, right? But there's some things that you know. So if you're getting a patient that is a status post-ORIF, open reduction internal fixation of a hip, 
you kind of already know before you even look at this patient, the kinds of things that the patient's at risk for because they're a surgical patient post-op, right? So they're at risk for post-op DDT, they're at risk for post-op pneumonia. What do we do about that? Well, anti-embolic stockings, using the incentive spirometer, boom, there's a care plan. Do you see how easy this is? And remember the nursing diagnosis itself is really kind of meaningless. What is important is the entire care plan. So here's the diagnosis and then what are we gonna do? What do we do about it, okay? So I'm gonna give you a scenario. You have a 60 year, 68 year old Caucasian female who was admitted to the med surge unit status post an ORIF, then reduction, internal fixation of the left hip after a fall at home. And so when we say hip, we're talking about a fracture to the neck of the left femur. So she broke her hip. She's a and times three, wake alert and oriented times three. So in other words, she knows where she is, when it is, and who she is. She's five foot four inches tall. She weighs 78 kilos, which is about 178.6 pounds. I'm going to stop. Anything a problem here? Five, four, 178 pounds. Okay. Her pulse ox on room air at rest is 96%. What's going to happen when she moves around? Is it going to go down? Temperature, tympanic, 98.1. Eh, not remarkable. Apical heart rate, 78. RRR, regular rate and rhythm, okay? Blood pressure, 158 over 80. Respiration's 18 and unlabored. Lungs are CTA, clear to auscultation. And she states that she's got pain at the surgical site. It's a six out of 10 on the numeric scale. She's got a history of type two diabetes. Oh, what do we know about diabetes and how it affects the healing of wounds? No, 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 right? Look at all the information just in this little paragraph about this patient, right? So she's got history of type two diabetes. She takes 500 milligrams um, PO metformin three times a day. She's got hypertension. It's controlled with lisinopril, 10 milligrams PO BID. She's got a history of falls in the last year. Here's some labs. Hemoglobin A1C, 9.5%. What's wrong with that? Right, for somebody who's a diabetic, what's the goal for a hemoglobin A1C? less than 7%, okay? Her hemoglobin's a 12, hematocrit's 41%, white blood cell count 7,600, platelets 185,000, BUN 17, creatinine 1.0. Her fasting blood sugar this morning was 194. 194. She's been placed on regular insulin with a sliding scale, okay? So just with this information, just say to yourself, what am I concerned with with this patient well, you've got a lot of concerns, right? What's wrong with her? What could go wrong based on what you know about her? How about that hemoglobin A1C and that morning blood sugar, right? Those things are a problem. So let's see what I came up with. <clears throat> so she's a diabetic, hemoglobin A1C is 9.5%. We know that erratic blood sugars, blood sugars, they're high, they're low, they're high, they're low. Sure, we can give you insulin and bring it down, but geez, Louise, every time it's up, it's just gnawing away at all the little blood vessels and the nerve endings in your feet and legs, your kidneys, and your eyes. Diabetic nephropathy, diabetic peripheral neuropathy, and diabetic retinopathy, right? So those blood sugars, because of the decreased circulation and the damage to the nerves in the feet and the legs and the rest of the body, delays wound healing, increases risk for infection. She's post-op, she's got an incisional site that's painful and could become infected. She's obese. And I did the math and got her BMI. So based on her weight and her height, so her BMI is 29.5. She's obese, okay? She's gonna need assistance, right? A walker with ambulation and transfers, et cetera, et cetera. And there's more than that. I just kind of gave the most, you know, the ones that were like in your face. So right away, risk for infection, pain, risk for delayed surgical recovery, and obesity. There's four nursing diagnoses right from the NANDA list. Now, how do we make the care plan? Okay. If it's a risk-based diagnosis, it's got to say risk for whatever, as evidenced by whatever the risk factors are. So for example, I give you here risk for infection as evidenced by immunosuppression and neutropenia. But for this little lady, we
We got risk for infection as evidenced by history of type two diabetes mellitus and a recent hemoglobin A1C of 9.5%. I picked this as the primary because could it kill her? If that wound doesn't heal and gets infected, that incisional site, she could become septic and die. So that's going to be my primary diagnosis, okay? And then the second one that I chose was pain because pain is a problem, not just for the patient's comfort, but it interferes with the patient's ability to participate in physical therapy. It interferes with things like it makes their blood sugar go even higher. Their vital signs will become elevated and those things will all delay her healing. So now this is an actual problem focused nursing diagnosis. So it's got to read, you know, what is the diagnosis? So pain related to surgical incision as evidenced by well, what are the defining characteristics or the patient complaint? Well, patient rating was six out of 10 on a numeric scale. Boom. There's your, now we have two nursing diagnoses written out. Next. So what do we do? Where do we go from here? We look it up. You can't make this stuff up. You look it up. Nurse labs, there are pl plenty of places, your textbooks to look up interventions and rationales. So for the nursing diagnosis of risk for infection, I'm going to say the nursing staff will assess incisional site Q4 hours for the next 48 hours. And the rationale for that is signs of infection, bacterial and drainage when assessed early, allow for quick intervention to prevent systemic infection. I'm going to be dropping mic all day. And then two, another intervention, patient will be instructed on signs and symptoms to report. Rationale, why? Because early identification and intervention facilitates a better prognosis, right? If we identify it early, we intervene early, we're more than likely able to fix it. And then our outcome, patient's incisional site will remain free from infection with no purial and drainage, no increased pain, and no increased erythema for the next 48 hours. I'm dropping two mics. Boom! You see how easy this is? Okay. And then the second one for pain, well, what interventions could we use for pain? We're going to get Nursing staff will obtain an order for round-the-clock pain medication. Rationale, why? Because having scheduled pain med prevents the pain from reaching a level that becomes difficult to manage. It's called staying ahead or in front of the pain. And then two, patient will be instructed to alert nursing staff if pain exceeds a three out of 10 on the scale. Why? Early identification and intervention prevents the pain from causing complications like increased blood pressure, and impaired wound healing. And also, if we manage the pain, the patient is more likely to ambulate and participate in physical therapy, and that prevents other post-op complications. So what's our goal? Patient's pain will remain less than three out of 10 for the next 48 hours. So when we go back and evaluate, did it work or did it not work? So if the patient's pain remained less than three out of 10, yay, if it was, several times in the next 48 hours, maybe a five. Yeah, so we didn't quite get there. Doesn't mean we just throw it all away. What else can we do? Maybe we have to reevaluate what she's getting for pain, right? So it's so easy. It's like, bam, ba bam, bam, right? In your face. Here's the nursing diagnosis list. And even I broke it down by domains. And this is right from Nanda's website. So these are the only ones that you can use. Sometimes I will see a nursing diagnosis written and I'll be like, I don't think that's a nursing diagnosis, right? So you have to make sure that word for word, it's on this list, right? You have to make sure that it's on this list, okay? Um, there's deficient fluid volume and there's excess fluid volume, right? There's risk for imbalanced fluid volume, but there's not, risk for excess fluid volume. So in other words, it's got to be on the list and it's got to be on the list word for word. And there are plenty of nursing diagnoses here for you to choose from, you know, um, you can see that. So keep this list. This will help you. You say to yourself, what is, you know, what kind of problems is the patient having? So, you know, here we've got activity and rest. If you take a look here. So we could look at activity and exercise and say, well, guess what? Does she have impaired transferability or impaired walking? There's two more 
nursing diagnoses that you could come up with, right? Does she have a bathing self-care deficit? I bet she does, right? So what I'm saying to you is it's not hard. Look at your patient, figure out what's wrong, what could go wrong, and then pick one from the list and then find the interventions either in your textbook or online. It's that simple. You can't make these up, all right? And this is the whole list with all the domains. Some of them you'll probably never deal with, like impaired religiosity. But here we've got, look, impaired skin integrity, risk for impaired skin integrity, delayed surgical recovery, right? That's one of the ones. Risk for pressure ulcer, risk for shock. I mean, you see, it goes on and on, risk for falls. Most instructors don't like you to use risk for falls because pretty much every patient you're ever gonna see is a fall risk, right? And they're like, that's too easy or whatever. So anyway, here's your whole NANDA list, the entire list, okay? What more can I say other than I can drop this mic, boom, 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 okay? Care plans are easy. Don't work hard, work smart, right? Don't try to reinvent the wheel. Nanda has the list of diagnoses and that's it. There aren't any others besides what's on that list. Look at your patient, do your assessment, say what's wrong with this patient, look at the list and say, oh, that fits. And then find the interventions and rationales either in your textbook or online like nurselabs.com. Be careful online, make sure you only go to credible sites right? That's always a problem. Sometimes people will just Google and then the first thing that pops up on Google, they'll be like, all right, that's it. Make sure that it's credible. And remember that your goals, outcomes have to be time measurable, very specific. You know, if you're telling me that that patient has a fluid volume deficit and that your intervention is going to be that the patient should drink fluid, well, it's got to be. Patient will consume 3,000 milliliters of fluid daily. So your interventions might be, um, you know, provide fluids at the bedside that the patient likes. Always keep the pitcher full, right? So if it's handy, the patient's more likely to drink it. So there's the intervention and rationale. And the outcome will be patient will consume 3,000 milliliters of fluid daily. Do you see how easy this is? Stop making stuff hard. There's enough other hard stuff that you have to deal with, okay? So that's it for care plans. It's not magic, I promise, but I am. Anyway, all right, I'll see you with the next video, guys. Peace out.